good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. I hope you'll enjoy what we have to talk about this afternoon. Thank you, Michael, for your introduction. We'd like to begin, as is a tradition um, and a, an important protocol, actually, with this uh, particular opera, with if my computer will work for me, an acknowledgement of country. Uh, we acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation, and pay our respects to their elders, past and present. It is perhaps worth remembering that the Con is situated on country that has been a traditional meeting and ceremonial ground for many thousands of years before the arrival of Europeans to these shores. In addition, in the context of the material in today's presentation, we acknowledge the Anangu, the traditional owners of the Maralinga Trucha lands, the setting of our new opera, and thank them for permission to visit their beautiful country to research material for this work. And a word of warning for people of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander descent that some of the images and appearing in this presentation are of people who have already deceased. Uh, over to Bob. About two years ago, when I was very ill indeed, one late morning I had a phone call out of the blue. This is Anne Boyd. I've just read your book on Daisy Bates. Can you write a, a libretto for an opera? So I thought about it and thought, well, if David Maloof can have a go at, uh, at uh, <coughs> Ludwig Leichhardt, surely I can have a go at Daisy Bates. Kind problem. So I embarked on this very exciting endeavor, uh, which really in lots of ways cheered me up, because every day as I sat down at my laptop, it seemed to flow out. The poetry, blank verse, iambic pentameter, it all seemed to come out inexplicably, reminding me of that uh, question that was asked, I think, of Benjamin Britten once about the creative process. How did it work? And he said, <laughs> predictably, it's a rum go. It certainly is a very rum, a very strange uh, process uh, producing things like this that don't really seem to have much to do with oneself. Now for what I really want to say about Daisy Bates. Well, Daisy May Bates spent the years from September 1919 to May 1935 living in a little white tent near Uldia Siding on the South Australian side of the Transcontinental Railway, or the East-West Line, it was better known as. Prior to that, she had lived in a tent in the Fowler's Bay area to the south, and before that for a year near Eucla on the Western Australian side of the border. Altogether, she spent more than 20 years in what Australians of her era called the Never Never, their metaphor for that remote part of central Australia seen as being beyond the realms of civilised life. When the late 19th century bush balladist Barcroft Boak used the expression in his poem, Where the Dead Men Lie, he was evoking that area beyond the pastoral frontier where neither animal nor human life could be easily sustained. What I want to do today is to suggest how Bates, popularly known as the Great White Queen of the Never Never, adapted to living on the edge of that Nullarbor Plain, or Gondiri, that great wilderness which still exercises a subtle influence, a subtle effect on the consciousness of those who live near it. Part of Bates' continuing iconic significance, although it's much less than it was in my childhood when she was a household name, is that in this remote location, she maintained a one-woman crusade representing to her poor blackfellow comrades the best of what civilization, and I mean British civilization of the early 20th century, could produce. At the same time, she had no wish to induct what she called my natives into that civilization. She was there to record their language and traditions and protect and nurse them until such time as they disappeared from the face of the earth. In her own famous words, to soothe or smooth the dying pillow. From her socialist Darwinist point of view, or social Darwinist point of view, that they were, that they were on the edge of extinction was the inevitable result of the evolutionary process. She had no interest in teaching Aborigines English or in converting them to Christianity. The authority she wielded over them, also due in part to the magical status attributed to her by them, with her active encouragement, 
She wished to use as a special commissioner appointed directly by her beloved king with responsibility for their care. An imperial loyalist, she saw herself in the tradition of the great empire builders, Raffles, Lugard, T.E. Lawrence and others, and the enlightened way in which she believed the empire had treated its native peoples. Now all this still begs the obvious question, why did she stay in the desert for so long? Bates unintentionally wandered into a way of life that provided three essential qualities. Personal independence, by virtue of her modest journalistic income. A sense of public theater in the persona she created for the outside world with the journalistic assistance of people like Ernestine Hill. And her exercise of personal power over the Aborigines. Ultimately, though, she found herself trapped, unable to leave because she lacked the means to live anywhere else at the same time demanding public recognition of all those years of what she regarded as service. In 1934, she told a friend that her terms for returning to civilization were a dame ship and 400 pounds a year, quite a considerable amount in those days. But who was interested in negotiating such an arrangement with an eccentric and imperious old lady? Was she suffering from the delusions of a grandeur of her own creation? Certainly. As it happened, the generous contract with the Adelaide Advertiser arranged by the journalist Ernestine Hill provided Bates with a timely exit from Uldea in May 1935, but not an alternative to her by then well-established way of life as a tent dweller. After the euphoria of the first year in Adelaide, working with Hill on a series of articles intended to form a book and spending her newfound wealth like a drunken sailor, <laughs> Bates fled to Loxton on the Murray River to pitch her tent once again. Then, in early 18, 1941, she made a disastrous attempt to re-establish herself at Winbring Siding, 60 miles east of Uldea on the Trans Line. Back in Adelaide, she was doomed to live out the last decade of her life in genteel poverty and suburban anonymity. Living in a tent had been her way of achieving harmony with nature as well as isolation from her own kind. Bates had deliberately, at Aldea, isolated herself even from the four or five families of railway fettlers or gangers who occupied the galvanised iron huts near the siding. Privately dismissing them as low whites, she spoke to one of the fettler wives from time to time when she needed assistance and even befriended one of the children, a little girl. However, she was extremely protective of her privacy even there. A brushwood fence marked the boundary <coughs> to be observed by visitors, including Aborigines, who wished to have an audience with her. <coughs> Although she devoured letters and newspapers, Bates at no point owned a wireless or a gramophone that might otherwise have kept her attuned to the sound of the human voice. Increasingly, she focused her attention on the birds and animals that frequented her tent. The desert finches and wrens she provided with water from her own precious supply each day, delighting in their appreciative singing, which was her only music other than the sound of the wind and of her own voice. The plain is never silent, she wrote, never free from the sound of the winds on any day throughout the year. Forever and ever their varying music may be heard by such solitary intruder as has the hearing and the understanding heart for their wild and primitive cadences. All this gives us a clue as to what helped sustain Bates during all those years in the desert. The climate at all deer siding is one of the hottest and driest that the continent has to offer. In the midsummer months of December and January, it could often remain for a week or two at 120 degrees Fahrenheit in the shade, and there was not a great deal of that. During the first, the worst of those blistering days, Bates adapted in the same way that desert animals and the Aborigines did. She lay prostrate in her tent all day, avoiding all physical exertion and taking the occasional lemon drink, a glass of boiled water with just a few drops of precious lemon juice and a pinch of salt and sugar. On these days, when her mind must have been in a state of suspended animation, she subsided on her camp bed until the heat abated and she could rouse herself to the daily regime of cleaning and tidying herself and her tiny uh, tent. 
Of her diet, we know very little except that she consumed modest quantities of tea and damper, bush tucker provided by the Aborigines, and an occasional rabbit that she shot with her .38 revolver. It was only towards the end of her time at Aldea that she arranged to use the trans dining car twice a week during the train's stopover to take on water pumped from the Aldea soak, which is the reason why the siding had been built, to give the trains the access to, to water that uh, was needed for the long trip across the Nullarbor. What were her spiritual resources? Brought up as a Catholic at Ross Cray in northern Tipperary in Ireland, where she attended a local convict school, a uh, convent school. <laughs> she, uh, she, interesting fr Freudian slip. She described herself as an Anglican from early 1883 when she married Edwin Breaker Morant at Charters Towers. That's a marriage that lasted roughly two weeks. <laughs> as the years went by, she became more strident in her condemnation of the Catholic Church and its political machinations in Ireland and Australia. She was a very good hater. She hated the trade unions, she hated the Labour Party, she hated Jews, she hated Germans. <laughs> She continued to believe in a personal God, an idea from which she seems to have derived comfort as she sang her nightly hymn. But there was no Bible or other religious works among her store of books in which Dickens took pride of place. Nor did she have any interest in taking the Christian message to Aborigines forced in from the desert by the drought. Indeed, she was vehemently opposed to the idea, believing that their own powerful spirituality would never allow them to seek the Christian message. Bates' main coping technique was writing, producing articles for newspapers and magazines which provided her only income, as well as letters to friends and acquaintances. Although at times with her deteriorating eyesight due to sandy blight or trachoma meant that she could not even see what she was writing, she couldn't even see the sheet of paper that she was scrawling on, Bates kept up a steady stream of missives to people in various parts of Australia and overseas, including her publisher, John Murray. Bates was in, those of us who have suffered the temporary loss of internet access know how much we depend on instant communication. Bates was in the grip of a similar phenomenon, except that she had to wait a week or two for her replies. Each train day, she would walk the kilometre and a half from her camp to the siding to collect her private mailbag and take it back to her tent to explore its treasures in private. Letters were her lifeline to an outside world which marveled at her self-sacrifice, nurturing her high sense of self-esteem. What also sustained Bates during those years was her ability to come to terms with the desert, not just physically, but aesthetically and emotionally, spiritually. She was living much closer to the southern than the western edge of the continent, but it was the vast, featureless and treeless expanse of the Nullarbor Plain to the immediate west that dominated her imagination, rather than the vast expanse of empty ocean that stretched from the southern coast as far as Antarctica. The Great Plain, with its mysterious underground caverns and blowholes and its terrifying taboos for the Aborigines who dared not venture over it for more than a few miles, was a vast and powerful presence and a constant challenge to her consciousness. While Bates's writing on the Aborigines is well known, even notorious for what she had to say about cannibalistic infanticide and cannibalism in general, together with the inevitability of racial and cultural extinction, and of course her attitudes to people that she called castes, which really has damaged her reputation since the 1960s, she is less well known as a nature writer. This went back to an epiphany that she experienced as a journalist in Western Australia, visiting the Murchison goldfields of the northwest of Western Australia in the early years of the 20th century. For the first time, it seems, her aesthetic sensibilities had begun to adjust to the subtle beauty of the Australian bush. And of course, she'd spent her first 21 years in Ireland lush green Tipperary and then Charters Towers. So now it seems that the, her aesthetic sensibilities were beginning to adjust to her new circumstances. As one becomes familiar with its gaunt gum trees, its apparently miserable attempts at watercourses and rivers, 
its huge plains of sand and scrub, she wrote on her return from the Murchison, a certain harmony grows on one. From September 1919, when she first went to Uldia Siding, her feature articles, or rather essays, because they are long, and they are long because she was paid by the column inch. Mm. Her feature articles for the Australasian, whose Melbourne editor, William Hurst, appreciated her talent and encouraged her, a testimony to her fine powers of observation and description of nature. And incidentally, in one of those interesting developments, I think she fell in love with Hearst through correspondence. Not, not that it was requited. She even sent her photograph to him, which is a sure sign. <laughs> a writer with a strong poetic sense, Bates came to terms with the plain's vastness, about 100,000 square miles of it, by employing a lyrical mode of description. I'll read what I think is one of her best passages. Its hazy distances sometimes seem like an untroubled sea, and its frequent mirages in summer give it the appearance of a series of lakes. The beauty of colour awaits interpretation by an artist born and bred in its vicinity. It glows in the bright sunrise of summer and becomes a silver grey lake on misty mornings. Long streamers of blue and brown, gold and purple will come and go over its ever-changing surface. And in the soft twilight of autumn, it's a, it assumes a mysticism that makes one think of Egypt before the days of Sphinx or Pyramid, or of the Buddhistic Nirvana. The crescent moon shines palely over it as through a veil. Sirius and the cross seem to sink on its broad bosom as they make their destined round. And even the Aborigines along its edge seem as if they must have had something more than materialism to cling to, for they have peopled the plain with a magic dragon of their own, as well as the spirits of the dead, who touch the plain as they emerge from their mortal bodies to catch the hand of Kudulba, that is the larger and smaller Magellan clouds, the two brothers who lift the spirits up to their home amongst their dead folk. So she's looking into, she's echoing Aboriginal uh, beliefs about the various constellations. Bates also helps us understand how she could come to terms with this outwardly harsh environment by employing not only a much finer focus of the senses, but a higher level of sensibility. Often, she wrote, the only thing that counts to the dweller on the plain's edge is the unexpected pleasure of a new bird note or the brilliant red gleam of a native plum or of a little fragment of wattle gum shining like a beautiful topaz in the bright sunlight. And perhaps after a day's tramping over the plain, only a delicate little perfume will be isolated. Yet each day brings such radiance with it, a morning or evening rainbow, an exquisite midday skyscape with great alpine clouds moving lazily in a sapphire sky. Bates borrowed the ways in which the Aborigines had peopled the plain by repeating their stories about the great serpent or Ganma who lived in the underground caverns and whose terrifying calls were the roar of the subterranean blowholes. At the same time, she made sense of the vast and glittering night sky through the Aborigines' stories about the origins of the constellations. If high summer provided little respite other than the empty promise offered by storm clouds on the desert horizon, the subtle changes of season were seized upon and given enhanced meaning in her writing. All this does not mean that Bates coped for the whole time in the desert. There were at least two occasions referred to obliquely in her letters when she suffered mental and physical breakdowns. To have described these more fully would have been a confession of weakness that she could never make to anyone other than her beloved William Hurst. By May 1935, however, one major change was working to dislodge her from Uldea. The arrival of the United Aborigines Missions Miss Annie Locke two years earlier and her establishment of a rationing station nearby had ended Bates' monopoly of authority over the Aborigines and challenged her very raison d'etre. What can be said about the outcome of Bates' long self-exile from her own people, from her own environment, in a situation stripped of almost everything familiar to civilised life? Did it result in any profound insights into the workings of the human psyche? 
Did it provide some breakthrough in mutual understanding between Aborigines and white Australians? Did it result in a more profound spiritual epiphany like those experienced in the desert by the prophets of the Old Testament, which might provide us today with a direction for our own lives in this ancient continent? The answer to these questions is a resounding no. What Bates did leave us with, however, was a poetic evocation of her harmonious relationship with the Never Never and its first inhabitants, now represented by Anne Boyd through the medium of poetry's first cousin, music. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bob, who's now introduced some of the main themes and characters of the opera through that wonderful uh, description of Daisy and her life at Aldea. Bob raised some of the questions about whether uh, Daisy left any kind of message, as it were, to future generations. I like to think that she did, that she is a kind of myth, a kind of icon in Australian cultural history, and that opera as a medium is singularly well suited to the telling of mythical tales. Uh, and to, co to corroborate that, um, you may have noticed this image of Sid Nolan, which has reappeared several times while Bob has been speaking. It's a painting he calls Daisy Bates at Aldea, which is, of course, where the title of my opera comes from. He says himself of this painting that it is only in myth that the truth about any country can be found. Nolan had travelled with his wife and daughter uh, to the centre of Australia in the year before he painted this canvas. Uh, and when he got back to Sydney um, with his love for the outsider, uh, he painted uh, the picture that we've been looking at. You'll have noticed in the canvas that Daisy is placed in the centre of a powerful desert landscape, a small figure of colonial propriety and determination. And so I must admit I have conceived her in the writing of this opera. She's a conflicted and therefore a richly operatic character and her story offers a complex site for the exploration of collaborative practice in which indigenous and white fellas can tell an Australian story. When I first thought of writing this opera I realised that inevitably I was going to have a lot to do with Indigenous people, and so it has been. I drew some of my inspiration from what I fondly call the Fish Rock, which is a rock which is situated in Canberra, just beneath, beneath the National Portrait Gallery. And on it, I discovered words by an Aboriginal man, Gatchil Jekara, uh, which I will read out to you. In it, he says, on this rock, he says, if we want to break away from the colonial past and begin anew, then we have to walk together, hand in hand and side by side, as a truly reconciled nation. That statement has resounded in my own mind at every stage in the conception of this work. And of course, his words preempt Rudd's speech by some four years, Rudd's apology, 2008. Gatchul Jukara was a senior elder of the Wangari people of East Arnhem Land, up at Yakala, uh, in Australia's far north. He was chairman of UTSIC from 1996 to 1999, um, uh, which of course was the representative Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission uh, that uh, existed at that time. In the last decade of his life, he moved between the two worlds of Canberra politics and his distant homeland that looked out on the Arafura Sea. Two Ways Opera then, had to be the way in which I proceeded in the composition of Daisy Bates as Aldea. How did I bring this about? Well, to begin with, its artistic director is an Aboriginal woman, a freelance music producer, Alice Haynes, whose four children are connected through patrilineal descent to the Anangal, the traditional owners of the land on which the opera is situated. It has a main indigenous character who, in a sense, uh, plays opposite Daisy in many ways throughout the work. Uh, Nabri, played, be played in our, our production by Graham Merritt. It draws on Pichinjara in the telling of the Eagle Hawk myth about the making of the Southern Cross. Pichinjara is 
possibly the old, uh, one of the world's oldest, if not the world's oldest, living language. The opera projects a dreamtime cosmology, both in its setting and through its principal characters. The encounter between a white woman and the Aboriginal world on the edge of European civilization offers a site for the exploration of complex issues surrounding Indigenous representation in Australian creative arts, as well as scope for collaborative practice in the telling of a contemporary uh, Australian story. In making an opera, time has of a special significance. In the writing of history, time too is a medium that is uh, uh, of considerable importance to the historian. Daisy Bates at Aldea is a chamber opera which lasts for about uh, 85 to 90 minutes. To fit within a limited theatrical setting, the historical narrative that Bob has spelled out for you of some 16 years at Aldea is compressed into a time span of just two days. The prelude music and Ganba link to a timeless dreaming space. Ganba is the name of the rainbow serpent who lives under the Nullarbor Plain to whom uh, Bob has already referred. In my work, myth morphs into landscape, morphs into Gamba, morphs into the coming of the first steam trains to cross the Nullarbor. When the first steam trains ran across, the Aboriginal people fled in terror, believing them to be Gamba had come out from under the earth to, uh, to pursue them, and some literally died of fright. I'd like to play you a little of the music that I've incorporated into the opera, as is common in writing a large work. Composers do a couple of studies before they get into the main meat of the composition. And in this case, I decided to write my Ganba music, uh, the music that was to have the strongest uh, indigenous uh, representation in it throughout the work. And in playing this, I'm happy to introduce Michael Duke, uh, our wonderful um, professor of saxophone here at the Sydney Conservatorium, and David Howey, his accompanist, on their new CD, Australian Portrait, which has just come out. As I play this music through to you, I'll project the lines of Daisy's recollection of this particular myth, and I hope that the music will illustrate for you the lines, and I hope you'll be able to read the lines from where you're sitting.
Moving on then to the characters of the opera, obviously Daisy is uh, the principal character. Narbury, an Aboriginal king of Aldea, who was a close friend of hers, is the other principal. Uh, Ernestine Hill, who was a much younger woman, about 30 years younger than Daisy, but already a well-established writer, who comes out to Aldea to take Ernestine, to take Daisy back to Adelaide to write their book. Uh, Annie Locke, the missionary lady, a lowish mezzo who uh, in fact is uh, uh, Daisy's undoing. She has a companion. The station master, Bolam, was at Aldea for about five years while Daisy was out there and wrote a wonderful little book on his experience called The Trans-Australian Wonderland, describing the nature, the flora and fauna, and the Aboriginal inhabitants of the area. He clearly loved the place and, like Daisy, was a wonderful observer of nature. While Daisy is there, one of the uh, significant incidents that happens is a visit from the Prince of Wales in 1921. Another close companion of Daisy's was a, a little 10-year-old child uh, of a fettler who appears in the opera as a child singer. The chorus is made up of fettlers, or railway workers, as we would call them today, six husbands, six wives, along with two or three children, including Bonnie, in non-singing roles. And then there's an anangal chorus, which for reasons mostly to do with uh, finance and, and logistics, and being unable to get anangal people to Sydney to perform these roles, uh, will be, has been pre-recorded and will be played from off stage. Very briefly, running you through a synopsis of the work, it begins, it's in three scenes. It begins in the first scene, a kind of sonata form, introducing all the main characters, very early morning, at Aldea Siding. The station master, Bolam, sings a poem he has written himself, describing the wonderland that is the country around Aldea and the Nullarbor Plain. Preparations begin for the arrival of the prince, whose train also carries writer Ernestine Hill and missionary Annie Locke. Trains are wonderful devices for getting characters on and off stages, and uh, we've used the train quite significantly in the opera for that purpose. The Prince of Wales arrives, as he literally did in 1921. He meets Daisy and Narbury, who explain their roles at Aldea, and he's treated to an entertainment by the local Aboriginals. And here's an archival photograph of some of the Aboriginal people who performed for him, dressed up for the occasion. The, we've taken a little bit of license here. This entertainment actually took place at Cook Siding, which is about um, 100 uh, kilometres or so further west of Aldea. A Daisy travelled there for the purpose. He then departs in the waiting train. Uh, then, after he's gone, the excitement uh, subsides. Ernestine Hill, a writer, the writer, steps forward to introduce herself to Daisy. And Daisy, uh, much to Ernestine's surprise, because Ernestine wasn't sure what kind of reception she might meet, invited her to stay a few days at her campsite. The two women exit. Daisy's actually delighted about Ernestine's arrival because uh, she's quite vain. She does like a bit of public attention, does old Daisy. And she's getting going to, she knows she's going to get it through Ernestine. She respects her quite a lot, which is unusual in, for Daisy. She wasn't a great respecter um, of anyone she considered particularly beneath her. Bit of an old snob, really. Annie Locke, the United uh, 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 Australian Missions lady, introduces herself to Station Master Bolan after Daisy and Ernestine have conveniently left the stage. And, the, and, and to the Fettlers, and her music parodies, it's one of several parodies I use in the opera, the popular uh, Arthur Sullivan tune to Onward Christian Soldiers. You all know it very well. Uh, the Fettlers are delighted to meet her and embrace her mission. They're fed up with hoity-toity Daisy and don't think much of her welfare work with the Aboriginals. The second scene takes a position, if one imagines the opera as a kind of symphony, as a slow movement. It's set at Daisy's white tent with the gate in brushwood fence beyond which no one but the invited dare step. And the time frame is sunset. A recent photograph by Hideki Soda, who accompanied us out there uh, not long ago, sets the mood, I think, for this scene very nicely. Daisy lights a fire and starts to cook a supper of rabbit that, as Bob told us, she shot herself with her revolver and a damper. Then comes the long reflective aria that Amy and Anna will perform for you in a moment. Uh, and uh, in this aria, she tells Ernestine of her love of the desert, its silence, its changing moods, and the freedom and independence life there gives her. She also reflects on the events of her former life. It, in a sense, is the centre of the work. 
The time frame then shifts into full night time, the wonderful stars that are so, some of you will know from the desert, which are so close, one feels one can reach up and touch them with one's own hands. The Aboriginal king, uh, Nabri, appears at Daisy's Gate. She takes him to her tree observatory from where he sings the eagle hawk myth telling of the making of the Southern Cross. The legend in our production is read by Trevor Jamison uh, and will be enacted by Graham Merritt as a sand drawing. Ernestine observes and writes in her notebook in rapid shorthand. Attached to the slow movement, without any uh, uh, pause really, goes into a scherzo and trio, a busy movement. This is the morning of Daisy's last day at Aldea, and it's the end of her reign as Queen of the Desert. The two women wake up and prepare breakfast together. Ernestine says again, she wonders how Daisy can live the way she does. Daisy explains it is her life's mission to do this. She begins to make some porridge-like gruel in a large tin basin over a fire, all of which is faithfully quite historically accurate, actually. Then, help, across the sand hills can be seen Annie Locke and her companion tramping into their campsite, without invitation, I might add. Uh, Locke can offer the Aboriginals much better tucker uh, at her newly established mission and the Aboriginals who've come to see this, uh, this uh, encounter, this unpleasant encounter between Annie and Daisy, uh, follow her off with excitement, thinking of their better tucker and, um, and uh, bread and clothing that she can give to them. Uh, the two women are left shocked and stunned and Daisy sings, this is the end. Station Master Bolam comes to the rescue by waving Ernestine off stage. Ernestine returns fairly quickly after Daisy sings a desolate moment of her feeling that the, really the end of her life has come. But Ernestine rushes back in on stage, flourishing a telegram. The Adelaide Advertiser has offered a generous commission to Daisy to write up her life story. Ernestine produces the cheque, which is a very handsome thousand, uh, thousand pounds, and begs Daisy to return to Adelaide with her to write her book. Uh, offering her some assistance as an amanuensis, editor and friend. Remember, Daisy by now is about 76 years of age, so it's quite an undertaking. Then we reach the final scene of the opera, and this isn't a long scene, but it, it is again a little bit reflective at its start. It's late afternoon, and Daisy is sitting on the siding with Bonnie, to whom she gives her trunk of possessions. They sing another period hymn, now the day is over. And as far as I can tell, this is probably the hymn that Daisy sang herself to sleep with each night in her little tent. Narbury arrives bearing the sacred Tringa boards. He warns her about betraying the sacred knowledge of his people, but Daisy explains that she'll give the Tringas to the big library in Canberra for safekeeping. She asks that her Aldea tents be maintained in return and kept safe and sound. This hasn't happened, although her sight is still clearly discernible in the sand dunes, and I've had the great excitement of going out there and sitting, in fact, where she may have slept uh, at Aldea. The train pulls in and Daisy and Ernestine get on board. The fettlers, Bolam and Annie, sing farewell to Mrs Bates, making it clear that she should not return and that if she were to do so, she wouldn't be particularly welcome. They sing again of the hardship of their lives in the desert, but they will carry on regardless and that idea we will carry on is kind of a, a kind of stoical thing that I think is particularly pertinent to the Australian uh, um, cultural story. They all disperse and night falls and so the opera ends. Now how on earth do I put that story into music? What are the means that I actually use? So now I've decided to explain that a little by turning to the main aria of the opera, uh, My Little White Tent in the Never Never. A preliminary note on the use of musical symbolism is in order here, and I hope that I don't get too technical. Uh, if I do, that you'll be able to follow it even if you don't have a good theoretical knowledge of music. In the cycle of fifths, and perhaps um, uh, Amy could come and help me here. In the cycle of fifths, the foundation of Western tonality, the sharp keys move upwards from C progressively, each key adding a sharp. C is neutral, often used as God space by composers to suggest the purest light. Descending through fifths from C, we move down the cycle of flat keys. Mm -hmm. 
you'll notice there that in the sharp keys, the first five notes, G, D, A, E and B, are all white notes on the keyboard. If you all look at the piano keyboard, you'll see how the white is made up of white and black notes, you all know that. The white notes predominate in the sharp cycle. But when we go down through the flat keys, the black notes predominate. So we have B flat, E flat, A flat, D flat and G flat consecutively. So this giving the sense of darkness. I use this as a sort of personal means of creating musical symbolism. Sharp keys heighten emotion in an ascent heavenwards, whereas flat keys work in the opposite way, tugging us down into the depths. Hence, D flat can be the key of the earth. Musical symbolism, which we'd be aware of, is polysemous. That is, it's many meaning. It can mean many things at the same time. The aria is constructed as an emotional story leading from the extreme flat keys, which dominate, to the extreme sharp keys, which suggest transcendence. And here, another technical term, the magic of enharmonic relationships, whereby one set of keys or a note can be spelled as another, that is D flat, representing the earth, is the same as C sharp, representing the extreme light of heaven and perhaps the sun, is used to convey meaning and unity as the aria unfolds. Leaf motifs are also used, and we'll introduce some of those in a moment, as is quotation and parody, where reference uh, in the text suggests external musical sources. The aria is in five main sections. It was a long, uh, long piece of text. It was the first thing that Bob sent me, actually, and it was four pages of text, and for a composer, that is long. That's a lot of text for a single aria. It turned out to be about 12 minutes in length. So it was, it, it fell fortunately into, into some lovely and very clear sections. Section one represents Daisy's relationship to the desert. Section two shows her relationship with her natives as their Kabli, their mystic grandmother from the dream time. Section three talks of her resistance to missionization. And section four questions, she questions her own capacity to continue to survive out there at Aldea, the age of 76 with failing eyesight. In section five, she becomes nostalgic and remembers the events of her former life. And then she becomes quite cheerful again as she thinks every day of the sunrise and of renewal. So here we have in uh, the first section, uh, uh, which we have the desert. And the first of these little motives is heard. The aria opens expansively. The desert, after all, is a vast place. And the little motive at the outset might be thought to represent the presence of Daisy's tent. Its shape reminds me rather of her tent, actually, and it recurs throughout the opera. The underlying whole tone pedal, D flat, E flat, represents the earth. And perhaps, um, Amy, if you could just play us that little motive. Thanks. You'll hear that a lot as the aria progresses. The chords that follow outline a minor third, G to B flat. The lullaby motif closely associated with Daisy. This is an unconscious connection with painful feelings of loss and abandonment, herself as an orphaned child, and then as a mother who deserts her own son to go to London. If you think you can hear a little of the Brahms lullaby there, you are not incorrect. It is quite consciously there. We move then into the second section, which perhaps uh, Anna might like to sing a little of this for us. And here we move um, out of all the flats or darkness into the white light key space of C through the whole, though the whole tone earth pedal D flat. E flat is sustained deep in the bass and subverts the whiteness of the other, other uh, music. The drone on C suggests the memory of a ditch pattern. Perhaps Amy can play that. Oh, fine, thanks. Um, that is not a literal ditch pattern. I haven't used any literal uh, indigenous music in this work at all but it suggests the memory of a ditch pattern. There is no didgeridoo in this part of Australia. The ditch is located only in the north of Australia in traditional Aboriginal use. 
and perhaps now the, you'll notice as, as, uh, as Anna, uh, as Amy uh, uh, and, and Anna uh, play this next section, the use of the tritone, the mystic tritone, which is the exact midpoint in the octave which sets out this kind of mystical space where Daisy is the Aboriginal Kabali. Thank you, it's beautiful. Uh, so then we move on as she questions uh, uh, whether, she asks questions that we might ask of her. Uh, does she love these people, the last of a poor dying race? I see the world through their eyes, she says, I have the knowledge and power, but their hearts are a different matter. Can I even know what's in mine? This is the ultimate mystery that even the desert can't yield. In this text, she shifts back into her original mood mode, or the tent motive is repeated, and the presence of the desert reasserts itself. The uneasy augmented triads, double major thirds on A flat for Australia. Perhaps you could just play the A flat. You notice that augmented triad, two major thirds, is here used to suggest mystery. The same augmented triads are also the steam train whistle and associated as well with Ganba. I've carried the major thirds, brilliant light sonorities, forward from the previous section. And I won't have the girls sing this because we are challenged by time passing. In the next section, the music broadens out, but soothing the pillow of a dying race is a strangely awkward business, and here the D-flat harmony cannot settle while the didge drone on C continues to sound. There's a return to desert expansiveness in the next section of the aria, but the harmony modulates to a kind of G major, with the reference to Sullivan's popular Christian hymn tune, Onward Christian Soldiers, placed over a C pedal. Fairly obvious. Although, as, uh, um, as, as the aria's been sung, as Daisy sings out her words, you probably have need to have that pointed out to you to really be consciously aware of it. The bass parodies, marching as to war, the, those particular lines from Onward Christian Soldiers in a rising sequence. This, again, can be interpreted at many different levels. The repetition of the final words brings out Daisy's contemptuous snobbery, cheapest black tea. Huh! And uh, you'll hear that wonderfully performed in a moment. Then we reach the final section of the aria, which is a section of reminiscence and renewal. Out of the darkness of flats into the white world of sea over a G pedal, as Daisy reminisces, this is the most white the music becomes as it heads towards the sharp keys. This passage is overtly sentimental, though still laced with some painful chromaticism, mixed in with all these marriages, these uh, double bigamist relationships, is some pain. I think of Jack Bates, uh, and the breaker, uh, breaker Morant, of course, and the fine-looking ship's engineer, the three husbands who were in part of her life. So perhaps we can just have those, that sentimental uh, music in the piano. Mm -hmm. They're beautiful, thank you. And so the, the fifth section begins as Daisy wonders if she has some regrets. And then when she reaches a very tender moment in this reminiscence, she thinks of her angel child, Arnold, whom I left to his own sad career. When I was in Canberra, I discovered a letter that she'd written to the war uh, memorial, uh, to the war, war office that was held now in the war memorial in Canberra. And she is searching for her son. And it's so sad, she's very old. She's about 88 when she wrote the letter and she doesn't know where he is, and she just wonders if they have some record of where of his whereabouts. So it obviously was, a, again, a very painful uh, parting for her. In my dreams, their ghost comes to haunt me, she said, my white tent is not hard to find. As she sings of Arnold, I use the Brahms lullaby, the, the minor third motive that has dominated much of the opera, and that's combined 
simultaneously with the Aboriginal Maranoa lullaby, which are both placed over a sea pedal. Uh, perhaps we could just hear that bit. Thank you, lovely. Her mood of great sadness shifts immediately into a kind of transcendence as we move into E major brightness, but she cheers herself up thinking again as she wakes before dawn every morning to a new and miraculous world. Here A flat becomes G sharp, an enharmonic shift to affect the climax of the aria. This is sounded in the emotional high of B major expansiveness, a, very, a key very high in the cycle of fifths. To affect closure of the aria, the tonality moves into the most extreme light key of C-sharp major. Enharmonically, C-sharp, as I pointed out, is also D-flat. So the closing pedal fifth, C-sharp, G-sharp, contains the same pitches, D-flat, A-flat, with which the aria begins. Symbolically, in these moments, in a musical sense, earth and spirit are conjoined. In this unity, this oneness of things, lies transcendence as the music climbs heavenwards. And the girls will now perform the whole of the aria from its beginning.
Thank you, Michael. It was remiss of me at the outset not to uh, thank you for your introduction and uh, also to thank the Conservatorium for bringing me across from Fremantle uh, so kindly for this uh, really wonderful opportunity, uh, not least for the chance to listen to the wonderful rendition of the aria, which I found absolutely transfixing, mm. uh, the, and the music. Uh, I thought it was a, just a wonderful experience, and uh, in an eerie sort of way, it really brought Daisy's story to life in a way that uh, I guess only music can do. Um, so it was very thrilling to hear Anne's work. I'd heard the aria performed before, but this was really absolutely thrilling and a wonderful taste of what we're going to get in, uh, in roughly uh, four weeks' time at the Conservatorium. So thank you again, and uh, thank you, audience, for your interest, and uh, mm. I hope you were able to make it in uh, four weeks' time to the actual performance. And I do hope, of course, that uh, uh, everything, everything uh, goes as we would like it to go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.